All right, this thing is on. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. I know the conference is winding down and it's just after lunch. My hope is that my talk can be maybe a little bit more lively than some of the other ones and maybe it'll wake you up after you've eaten your meals and whatnot. Um, my name, my name is George Mandis. I'm here to talk about tiny computers, JavaScript, and MIDI, as you may have guessed. Um, there have been a lot of really wonderful talks here. There have been a lot of uh, very sort of cutting edge practical things you can probably use in your projects and your work at home. This will have none of that, I promise you. <laughs> I Actually, I would be impressed. I, if anyone uses this in their, their projects or work uh, coming away from this, I would really want to hear about it because it would probably be kind of interesting. Um, this, is, this is more about fun and experimenting with, pardon me, and experimenting with um, some curious cutting edge browser features and an old protocol that's been around since 1983. And it's interesting how this protocol invented in 1983 plays really nicely with the JavaScript we know and love today and the way we like to use it. So we're going to explore that. Um, a quick show of hands, who, who thinks they know what MIDI is? Okay, okay. We're going to dive into that a little bit because I realized, growing up as a musician, I, I've had a very clear idea my whole life and talking to people, I realized that's not always the case. So it's interesting to, to see. There's sometimes an overlap with the, the, the techie people, I think, and this technology. So it's interesting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself before I jump into it. Um, because I, I know you came here to hear about me, obviously. <laughs> uh, so my name is George Mandis. I'm from, I'm from the US. I'm a freelance web developer. I've done that for about 11 years, which feels like about 100 years if, when I look at what's changed in that time. I, I feel a lot older than I am. It's very strange. Um, yeah, you can find me at all these places online. I never realized until I made this slide, but if you if you were curious how to spell my name, this would also be a very useful slide because it's up there about five times, I think. Um, uh, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Uh, contact me if you have questions and things. It'll make more sense at the end, I suppose. Um, fun facts, <laughs> because everyone needs fun facts about the speaker they're about to listen to. I threw this up here originally because I thought people might be trickling in slowly from lunch. I actually, what I wanted to start with was an experiment that's going to involve some of you and hopefully your computers if anyone is willing to bring out their laptop. That's actually kind of a subtle hint. If, if there's anyone willing to participate in an interactive component in the next few minutes, feel free to get out your laptop and maybe fire up Chrome or some, some browser. Um, but until that point, uh, a couple of random fun facts about me to maybe help make this talk more memorable or maybe humanize me a little bit because sometimes we don't humanize developers enough. Um, so this is my first time in Russia. <laughs> I arrived a few days ago and I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, this hotel is very lovely. I look forward to coming back sometime and having a chance to explore more of St. Petersburg. Um, but seriously, I do want to come back. It, it seems like a beautiful city from everything I've heard. Um, I lived as a digital nomad for a year and I lived in 18 different countries living and working. That's uh, kind of an interesting story and could probably be a talk in and of itself, frankly. Um, I was born in Saudi Arabia, which is really strange when you're not Saudi. That's a really long story. I don't have time for that, but it's interesting. Maybe fun. Maybe these should be interesting facts. I'm not sure. And uh, I once unintentionally cheated running a marathon in North Korea. <laughs> Which, you know, I don't really advocate cheating on any marathon, but there are certain marathons where you should be a little more wary than others, I think. Anyway, those are my, those are my four fun facts. Oh no, I have a fifth one that's actually a little more relevant to what we're talking about now. Ever so barely. So, so a lot of people who are speaking at this event and attending, uh, you know, work for really impressive companies and big impressive projects. I was looking over my 11 year history and the project that, the only possible project I've done that I could be known for is a little thing called Konami JS. I'm, I'm doubting any hands are going to go up, but has anyone heard of it? No? Okay. It's okay. It has almost 600 stars on GitHub. <laughs> so Konami JS was, uh, I made that back in 2009, and it was a silly Easter egg plugin that allowed you to enter the Konami code on any website. And the timing was just right. Uh, I made it so it would work with gestures on your iPhone and all that stuff, which was, you know, at the time, a big deal. Um, 
And for whatever reason, that project got really popular and picked up in lots of other projects. Um, and thus began my history with creating frivolous things like this MIDI presentation and Easter egg JavaScript libraries. It seems that the things I, I get the most attention for end up being the things that are kind of frivolous and not practical, but I'm okay with that. Um, funny story about the Konami JS project. Uh, the big claim to fame of that one is it got used in production on two very big websites. One was marvel.com which I was very excited about at the time. I remember the, <laughs> uh, the developer on Twitter poked at me and said, hey, you should go enter the Konami code on marvel.com. And I checked it out and I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. And I remember at the time uh, I was hosting it on Google Code back in 2009. And he was linking directly to the raw files. And I was so excited by him using it. I said, oh, I'm going to clean it up and fix things and do all this stuff. And I, I did that. And I went back to marvel.com just to see it work. And their whole site was really fucked up. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I did something. And so I had to refer it really quick. So for about, for about 10 seconds, I broke marvel.com. That was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> and then the other one was Newsweek. Which was really funny. Someone had put the the Konami code in there as a sort of a debugging tool to replace all of the articles with articles about zombies, and that one was really funny. And someone on Forbes.com did some very like half-ass research and put my name in the articles, and somehow I got picked up on that. It was really odd. Anyway, th so that those are the only things I feel like I could possibly be known for at this conference, and I just wanted to share those up front. So let's, oh, that's right, I, I had this, uh, I, I was going to grovel for more, more likes on my GitHub project, but I'll skip that slide. So this is the one I really wanted to start with. Um, I'd really like to start with an interactive experiment. And if anyone, I'm not seeing any laptops, which might make it kind of, oh no, I am. Okay, okay. Because I only need a few people maybe to do this. Um, so before I even explain too much what's going on, if you could pull up that website you see at the bottom, uh, I'd like to hopefully do this interactive project with you guys. I also thought if I got done with this up front, then if this was a total disaster and it didn't work, then I could get that out of the way real early. So while you are getting that website up, I'm going to get a slightly different website up here on the screen. Oh, one of you's in. Okay. Two, three. Ooh, this is exciting. Can I hear four? Can I hear four? <laughs> All right. Four is enough. Um, so let's see if this works. Oh, also, you should have your volume ups, uh, volume up on your laptops. I didn't explain that. I guess I thought that might be clear. So if you could uh, crank your volume a little bit, um, it shouldn't be too loud. And let's see what happens here. Now, here's something. Where's that coming from? I, OK. You got no, no, you, you won't all get everything at once. You'll see. Let's see. Who's that? So you again? Okay. So you? Okay, because the light, there should be a little circle on the middle of your screen that lights up when it's your turn. Okay. Now, let's see, if there are, oh, there's eight or nine of you. Oh, I'm going to have to start playing faster because it cycles through all the people that are present. You're not, okay, I'll just start playing more. No, oh, that one's loud. I'm not sure who that was. So I don't think this is going to translate on the video at all. <laughs> but yeah, I thought this would be kind of a cool experiment. I'm actually really pretty pleased with this right now. It's fun up here. I can hear the sounds coming from different computers. And with, uh, with nine people in there, that's quite a good bit of um, uh, polyophony. I can, uh, there we go, start making chords. Maybe make like kind of a... So 
All right, there's, uh, I should also maybe preface this. This talk is going to be, it's going to be a talk about MIDI, it's going to be a talk about JavaScript, it's going to be talking about the tools I'm using to build these things. It's also just going to be a lot of really kind of wacky demos um, because, you know, although I'm starting with the musical examples, the, the, the crux of this talk is MIDI at the end of the day is just a bunch of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bunch of numbers one machine is throwing at another machine after you hit some buttons and we can do more interesting things than just make sounds I think with that and so I want to explore some of that um, okay that one went really well I was I was way too pleased with that honestly okay so um, and if you don't mind, I have one more. <laughs> I have one more. I promise you, we won't. It won't all be like this. I just want to get them done up front. So let me, my pull up my conductor's chair up here, and sort of a similar setup. You won't have to click on anything. This one's a little more. Um, I'll be less surprised if this one crashes and burns, but we'll see. Okay. Okay, two people. I'm going to wait until I get about five or so. I think once we get more than five, some of you won't get any sound, but I can explain why that is in a second here. So, so while I'm waiting for a second, um, we got a choice of songs here. Does anyone have any, uh, <laughs> any requests from the, the very random selection I've made of, of uh, MIDI tunes up here? What's which one? Star Wars. Star Wars? I, I, knew, I knew this crowd. <laughs> do you want to do, uh, do we want to do, well, I don't know. I, I guess do is uh, Star Wars, like raise a hand. No? Yeah. Oh, okay. Jeez. Fine. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. Honestly, this is the one I've tested the least. <laughs> 25. Holy crap. What happened? Um, that strikes me as a, as a bug on my end, but I'm not going to think about it. Um, okay, so this is going to take a moment. What it's doing right now is it's, it's taking apart the MIDI file, which has about, well, I think most of the other ones have six or seven parts. The Star Wars one might have more. It's, it's taking all the different parts of the MIDI file, and it's, it's parsing all those, and it's going to send those to each of you individually. So what should happen, if this all works correctly, is we should hear the Star Wars medley, but you're each going to be playing different parts, like you're all the orchestra now. Um, it takes a moment, though. It, it takes a few moments, and I've never done it with 25 people. Okay, so in 12 seconds, I know it's kind of an absurd countdown, but there's actually a reason I chose such a high one, because, you know, if this is, you'll see, let's just wait, three, two, one, let's see. <laughs> Crank that volume. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like it might have just stopped. Hmm. Well, the first one is really good. Oh. Oh, this one builds kind of slowly. I forgot about this. Maybe that's. Hmm. Is anyone else getting parts? I hear your part over there. The problem with the divvying up into so many parts is some of the tracks have like three notes in them, I found out. So you'll get like one blip and then nothing for a minute. I can hear you. Yeah, you might have gotten the main part. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I. <laughs> I'm going to go through the rest of the talk, and if there's time at the end, maybe we can try one more song. I'll try one of the ones I know works a little bit better. So um, you can just refresh the window if you want to stop the <laughs> Star Wars sound. <laughs> anyway, thank you for indulging me on that. That was, that was, you know, half a success. I'm okay with that. So what we're talking about today, we are talking about JavaScript, obviously. Um, oh, oops, sorry. I didn't close my window. You're not seeing the slide. What we're talking about today, JavaScript. Obviously, as this is a JavaScript conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about tiny computers. And I've basically been like making it my own term, because I don't really know what else to call them, because that is what they are. I'm talking about Arduinos, uh, Raspberry Pis, Esperinos. Um, and other things I know I'm forgetting at the moment. But basically, uh, 
little guys like this. Are, are people generally familiar with, with those that I've listed on the screen? Can I get a little show of hands? I'm curious. And how many people own one? I'm curious. Sure, okay. And how many, <laughs> well, I won't ask that actually. Okay, uh, JavaScript, tiny computers, and MIDI, obviously, musical instrument device interface. So why JavaScript? Uh, JavaScript is everywhere. I don't really need to tell you guys this, but um, you know, it's it's really impressive to me. It's I, I was talking the other day to someone, and it's you know, it's literally an interpreter that everybody, I mean, almost everybody in the world uses, whether they're really using it or not. It, it's got to be the most accessible language on the planet, for better or worse. Um, and we're finding it you know, in more and more places. It, it's become like sort of the universal language of, of just doing anything on the web. Again, for better or worse. You know? <laughs> um, so the, obviously that's, you know, one reason we would use JavaScript. Um, it's asynchronous nature uh, is a natural fit with the way MIDI wants to behave. MIDI, uh, even though it was, came out in 1983, it was trying to fulfill a very different role that we'll talk about. Um, it, it fits very naturally with the way we write asynchronous code in JavaScript, and it's kind of fun because of that. You know, it's just a series of events, and you're waiting for things, and it doesn't really matter when they happen. Um, yeah, it fits so naturally and nicely. It's kind of, it's kind of neat. <laughs> Um, and it's where the people are. You know, they're, like I said, in the last eight years or so, uh, you know, Node in particular, sort or, you know, the V8 engine, really, but like, um, JavaScript is found in more and more places. You know, it used to just be on the client side for a long time, and now we have server-side JavaScript, and now we have, like, embedded JavaScript in these tiny computers, like the one I'm holding in my hand. This is uh, an Esperino, and you can write, like, hardware-level JavaScript instructions on these things. And, you know, there's probably going to be more places in the coming years you can use your JavaScript code. And it just, you know, it makes... It, even if it's not a good idea today, I think it's worth tinkering around with in JavaScript to show you things to work. Um, so why why tiny computers? To be perfectly honest, I feel like I probably could have pitched this talk without it, but I just really love them. I think they're just so much fun. Um, so to clarify what I mean by tiny computers, here's all the ones I have at home. Well, most of the ones I have at home, I have a few more than that. We have our Raspberry Pis, our Arduinos. Um, I'm really partial to chip. Has anyone heard of the uh, chip computers? Yeah? Yeah, I think those are really, I, I really fell in love with those, not just because they're $9, <laughs> but um, they're just very uh, easy to use, a real low barrier to entry on those guys. Um, so just a brief uh, spiel on these guys. Uh, so Arduino was sort of the first one I remember being aware of, and it's still sort of the go-to tiny computer you would use for, like if you want to break out the breadboard and start soldering LEDs together and switches and making a more sort of interactive hardware-centric thing. Um, and uh, that's actually going to come into play a little bit later when we talk about building your own MIDI controllers. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is the one I sort of remember coming after that. Um, and what was interesting about that is that was like an actual computer. You could actually put an operating system on that and run all your software. And it was literally just a tiny computer you could hide on your bookshelf somewhere and have do interesting things. Um, and then, like I mentioned a minute ago, I really fell in love with the chip computer because although the Raspberry Pis are fun, you know, it's fun for the kind of people that like to spend half their day like setting up their Linux distributions and debugging things and finding drivers for things that you didn't realize you needed drivers for. And, you know, like those kind of people chip, like everything worked out of the box, which I think, you know, everyone can appreciate, but also I think it makes it more accessible for people who want to learn on these devices, which is actually a big um, component of my whole talk, actually. I think it's, this whole platform is a really interesting way to teach people how to do uh, curious interactive things in a way that has sort of a low barrier to entry. Um, and then Esperino is the one, I actually only discovered these existed like a few months ago. I was really excited when I did. And being able to write JavaScript like on the hardware, like on an embedded hardware level is really interesting and something I'm exploring and I think we'll probably hear more about over the years. Okay, yeah, they're fast, they're affordable, they're easy to use. The other thing that's fun is they're great for standalone projects. You know, I can buy a $9 computer, I can set it up to do one specific task, and I can leave it on my bookshelf, 
and I don't ever have to think about it. You know, when computers get that cheap, you can start putting computers in things you didn't really think you would never need to put a computer in. And I think that's, um, I don't know, I think it's fascinating. Uh, they're fun. <laughs> It's a helpful slide. The other thing that I think about when I think of tiny computers, it's sort of the, they're kind of like the hardware side of the open source movement in some ways. Like there's something very empowering, I think, about being able to buy the hardware, take it apart, put it together the way you like, install what you want on it, and run precisely what you want. You know, that's becoming more and more rare. We have these, you know, more and more capable services and tools and platforms, but we're, we're sort of acquiring them at the cost of a lot of freedom, I think, honestly. And I, I'm, you know, in all the ways I get sort of jaded and sad about that, I'm excited when I look at this, because this is something that when I was a kid, I would have been blown away by. So why MIDI? Uh, maybe a better question, what is MIDI exactly? Let's talk about it for a second. When, so uh, it stands for Musical Instrument Device Interface, which is, First, you kind of nod and think, oh, that makes sense. And you kind of think about it. You're like, wait, are those words in the right order? I'm not exactly sure, but sure. Uh, it's a protocol uh, for musical instruments, electronic musical instruments, to speak with one another. Um, it's also a standard. There's actually a standards body for MIDI that is very similar to the way standards are decided in our industry. They're still active today. They've been around since 1985. Basically, all the electronics music um, companies banded together and agreed how MIDI should work, and they, they maintain it. And, and similar to other standards, there's like dozens of derivatives with weird little sort of idiosyncrasies and things. Um, it's also a file format. So this is why when I ask, do you know what MIDI is, I think there's occasionally confusion because we sort of use the term MIDI interchangeably for all these things. You know, are we talking about the protocol? Are we talking about like a MIDI file? Are we talking about a MIDI capable piece of hardware? I mean, I guess we could be talking about all those things, but it's, I think it's good to clear up that it is all those things. Um, it was created in 1983, which is kind of, kind of old for something that we're going to be using in our browsers and JavaScript. I can't think of anything else that would be that old. I should think about that. Um, and then, like I said, yeah, it's maintained by the MIDI Association. It's a standard. It is not, it is not this. Precisely. I mean, this is a MIDI file. The reason I had this example is I remember growing up in the 90s before we had MP3s. For whatever reason, we listened to a lot of MIDI files. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, there's only so much of that I can take when I'm talking. <laughs> uh, I remember listening to these MIDI files, and at least when I was a kid in the 90s, the word MIDI just came, became synonymous with basically these chintzy sounding instruments and these silly songs and things like this. So it's, it's not this, which is a, a song that came uh, shipped with Windows 95 back in the day. It's not this, which is another one. I kind of like this one, actually. <laughs> Gotta wait for it. There we go. <laughs> and it's not this. Now this one's funny. So Brian Orr was an intern at Microsoft and they asked him to write this song to promote Windows 95 and he never got credit for it. There's an interesting blog post about it if you want to look it up. I also think it was actually really kind of fun looking at the credits for these obscure MIDI files to see who wrote them. Uh, for example, like Passport Designs, they're still around. They're like, they design really kind of strange looking music software. It was kind of funny. Anyway, so when we're talking about MIDI, we're not talking about chintzy sounding audio files, which I think a lot of people assume when you just say the word MIDI. We're talking about the protocols, we're talking about the standard, we're talking about, you know, a little bit deeper. Um, so general MIDI is actually a different thing. Those are the chintzy sounds. So it's actually a derivative of MIDI. It's, it, it's different. It, was, it came out in 1992. And basically all the electronic music uh, instrument manufacturers agreed, hey, if something is going to have general MIDI support, it should be able to create this set of 127 sounds. And we're all going to agree on what those 127 different sounds should be. And so the first one is like piano, and the second is guitar, and it goes down the list 
Um, and it gets weirder and weirder. And everything that has general MIDI support has to have support for these same 127 different sounds. And some of my favorites are guitar fret noise, breath noise, seashore, bird tweet, telephone ring, helicopter, <laughs> applause, and gunshot. So if you buy a general MIDI capable piece of hardware, you're gonna you're gonna have gunshots and seashores on that thing. I, standards bodies are great. <laughs> um, so MIDI the protocol. Uh, it, like I said, it allows electronic musical instruments to communicate with one another. It can describe common performance parameters, like, you know, this note is on, this note is off. It can describe maybe more obscure things you hadn't thought about, like, I'm going to bend this note, I'm going to modulate this note, which is some, a signal that could be up to interpretation by the thing that's receiving that modulation command. Um, it can also communicate other, other more general things that are not specific to the, the, like the, the notes being created on the instrument. It can say, like, oh, hey, we're at this point in the song right now. Let's all get on the same page. Uh, so MIDI the standard, like I said before, it was created by a bunch of musical instrument companies in, in the early 80s. Uh, it was those guys up there, Roland Yamaha, Korg, Kawhi, O'Brien, and Sequential Circuits. Uh, I was going to put their logos up there, but I could not find a logo for Sequential Circuits, so I just did that. Um, so these are the companies that agreed upon it, but uh, Ikutaro Kakahashi was kind of the leading force behind it, and if you do a little bit of reading about this guy, he's really, he's really interesting. He was sort of a pioneer in all manners of electronic music. He was, a, he was the founder of Roland and Boss and Ace Tone. He was one of the minds behind the TR-808 and the 909, and he invented MIDI. So he's, he's a cool guy. He's interesting. He was worth having a picture of uh, on one of my slides. There's MIDI the file format. Like we said, it describes MIDI events. So those, those uh, the, the MIDI protocol we were talking about earlier, when I, I'm describing, you know, hey, this note is on or this note is off, a MIDI file is just another format that contains that buried within it, basically. Um, it also describes, most importantly, it describes the timing surrounding those events. Uh, my demo earlier didn't demonstrate that very well, but if we try it again later, it might. Um, it kind of reminds me of an old player piano. Do people know what I'm talking about when I say player piano? Show of hands. Okay, interesting. Okay. Um, so the way those worked, since there weren't very many hands, uh, they would have a roll of paper inside the piano, and there were holes inside that piece of paper. And as the roll moved along, um, there was a mechanism inside the piano that would play the notes as it passed over those holes. And the where the notes fall on the paper and how long they are would dictate uh, you know, when the note is played and for how long the notes are played. This is actually a YouTube video. Um, oops, let me do this. It's worth playing for a second just to demonstrate if you've never seen it before. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it's actually n not an inaccurate way of thinking about how a MIDI file works. It also reminds me of Dance Dance Revolution the more I watch this. <laughs> Anyway, you get the idea. I mean, the real payoff is when they zoom out and you see the piano actually playing itself. I wish it came a little earlier in the video, but and then we zoom in on the paper for some reason. Okay, whatever. <laughs> And there's even more to be discovered. You could go down a rabbit hole of MIDI standards and protocols and things. There is a whole subset of MIDI designed to control light shows and theater productions, which is really interesting because that sort of delves into the area I want to talk about with doing things with MIDI that are not music, precisely. Um, there's general MIDI too, which to be honest, I don't really know much about. I just know it exists and it probably is better than MIDI, but uh, whatever. Black MIDI is interesting. It's like... Um, it's, it's not a standard, it's like a music genre where people write MIDI files that are impossible to play in real life with literally millions of notes. <laughs> it's, it, just, just look it up, it's pretty funny. Um, and then MIDI, oh, MIDI light control and show control are related but technically different things. Anyway, there's, it never ends. 
Okay, so back to the question. I, I just explained what MIDI is. And MIDI is a lot of different things, obviously. So why MIDI is the more important question. MIDI is asynchronous, as I discussed before. Uh, it talks to hardware, granted mostly musical hardware, but you, like I said, we can repurpose that hardware to do other things. And in a weird way, it's sort of a good way of dipping your toe into like the Internet of Things mode of thinking and dabbling. You know, we we can go out and purchase devices made in 1985 and hook them up to our computers, get them talking to our browser, and have a, a new interface, a new type of interface where you push a button and things happen. And you know, that's a simple interaction that I just described, but that's that's interesting. That's cool. And I think it's really cool that we're taking like an old piece of technology and you know, able to create new things from that. Oops, that's doing the YouTube video. Uh, it's really easy to repurpose. Um, as we'll see in a minute, the signal is pretty easy. It's not very complicated. Um, I have to show you this. I wish I built this. This is so cool. This guy took a... He, he built a MIDI stepper, and he's feeding a MIDI file into this thing that just creates voltage controls, and he's hooked up physical... Um, uh, like switches and things. I'm just going to play it. You'll understand. But basically, a MIDI file is controlling this thing. I'll just let it play for a couple seconds. I'm realizing I'm talking kind of slowly, so I'll hurry it up in a moment. So he's using MIDI note messages to control the motors and things that you see in this video in a second. I just got to notice that I can finally buy one of these. I'm going... I think that's so cool. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Oop. Yeah, I'll just do that. Okay. Escape is not making it go away. That's now oh, there we go. I apologize. Okay. And lastly, Chrome speaks MIDI, which is actually really strange, but really awesome for my presentation. So as of Chrome 43, uh, it has built-in native MIDI support, which I don't really know why they did that. My only thought is that it makes more sense for like Chrome OS, if they want it to be like a full-featured OS that can do a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, so you can, y your, your Chrome browser will natively support MIDI, and it's really interesting. And there are a lot of other existing JavaScript projects that support MIDI, so you know, there's just a lot of good stuff out there for it. So let's talk about different types of MIDI controllers. Like I said, you can you can go and buy uh, like all these MIDI controllers I have up here with USB support, or you can go find all the hardware you know in your attic or at a pawn shop, and with a MIDI to USB cable, you could hook that up to your browser in theory and start doing things that way. Uh, or you can build your own. You can use an Arduino and their existing MIDI libraries. You can download to turn your Arduino into a full functioned uh, like a legitimate MIDI device that would be recognized not only on your computer but on older pieces of like MIDI hardware that, that support that. And, and that's pretty interesting too. Um, so just some examples, some keyboards, the LPD-8, which I got up here, the Logi foot controller, which I got down here. Um, and then there's a lot of other weird ones. There's like breath control. There's accelerometer-based controllers. I, you know, I'm going to post my top, my slides later, and you can click on those links. But there are a lot of um, very strange MIDI controllers out there. Bananas is my favorite. <laughs> Mickey Mickey. You should look at Mickey Mickey if you're not familiar with it. You can basically put little alligator clips on bananas and turn them into a, oops, a piano if you want to. Uh, let's see. Or you can build your own with an Arduino, like I said. I actually, I had one I was going to bring in a week ago. I dropped it and it broke. I was really sad. And the only evidence I had of it was this, um, this really shitty video. So I'm just going to play it for a second. There it is. That's me at home. Just, I don't even know why I recorded this. I was just trying to make this work. And then I was going to do something much cooler. All those lights were RGB LEDs. And I had this great idea of making a big colorful thing. And I don't know, maybe next conference. Okay. Uh, anatomy of a MIDI message. Okay, every message, I'm going to race through this. Okay, every message is three bytes, and there are only two types of messages. There is a status message and a data message. 
A status byte will always begin with a one, and data bytes only always begin with zero. That will leave seven bits left per byte for expressing the message, which ends up being 128 different possibilities. Uh, for a status message, three of those bits describe the type of the status. That could be like note on, note off, pitch bend, modulation, and like a hundred other things. Um, and the remaining four describe what channel. So there's only 16 channels that that message, that status message could be applied to. Uh, so for example, this, these, if we break that down in three bytes, we have uh, the status code is 128, which is the MIDI standard for turning a note on, and it's telling it we want to turn the note on in channel one. The second data byte is telling us we want to have a data value of 127, and the third byte tells us we want to have um, a value of zero. It's okay if you're not picking up any of this, because to be honest, you don't really need to know this to do cool stuff with it. Um, so I sort of translated it there to explain, right, we know there's the status, it's a note on, uh, channel one, what I just said. And then, but when we deal with it in JavaScript, there are libraries that just give us a nice little array like that. And, and a message accompanying it, letting us know what kind of status it is. So we don't really need to know all that other stuff. Um, and then here's all the, just a very short sampling of all the different types of commands that can be sent. So there's note on and off, uh, poly pressure, and a bunch of different control changes. There's, there's lots of things. Some that I have no idea what they are, to be honest. Uh, anatomy of a mini file is very similar in that it's, um, it has three chunks, not three bytes, it's three chunks of information. Um, one of them describes the, the type, the other describes the length, and the other is the data. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I have a whole bunch of cool demos I just want to show you, to be honest, and you can read that other stuff later. So before we get too far into the more than music aspect of this talk, I want to show you the, some of the more musical aspects. So here is a very simple polyphonic synthesizer that I built in Chrome. Kind of cool. Um, what else? Under the hood, it uses these different uh, projects that are out there. Um, if you are interested in knowing more about them, come talk to me. Um, uh, but the gist of it is that Web MIDI, uh, although the, the browser has native MIDI support, Web MIDI sort of packages that up in a way that's a little bit nicer to use, particularly if you're making musical applications. MIDI Utils does some nice features where it'll take a MIDI note and translate that into a frequency that you can then feed to a, um, a web audio component that can interpret that into a sine wave and actually make noise. And Pizzicato is just a nice uh, library for interfacing with web audio and doing that. And basically, I, I have this, this for all my slides, like what's under the hood, that's pretty much the three I use for most of them, as you'll see. Uh, we have fun with control changes, so it doesn't just have to be like sine waves and chintzy noises. We can we can mess around with like samples, basically, which is kind of fun. We can change the pitch. We can even make them go backwards. Let's see, how do I do that? Anyway, you do all kinds of fun, trippy things with that. Um, under the hood, same thing. Interactive piano recital, that was the first one we did that went really well. Uh, oh, actually. That was using WebRTC, which I tried to use that, I tried to build that using WebSockets at first, and that was not very good. The latency with the WebRTC was significantly better and didn't seem to work um, pretty okay. Latency is a big issue, actually, if you're trying to make, you know, if you're trying to use this for like a live musical performance context, it's pretty tricky, but. Um, and then, let's see. Oh yeah, this is the one that did not work so well, but 
I promise you I have had it work well before. Uh, it was a little more complicated. I actually did use WebSockets for that just because it was a little bit easier and I could get it to work on tablets and phones and other devices and it was pretty cool when I had that working. I actually had people like in the park using it. It was, it was kind of cool. I, I, brought, I, uh, I brought one of these tiny computers and I can create a wireless network on that and then I can talk strangers into connecting to my wireless network and run this little piece of software and have weird sounds come out of them. That's what I do for fun. Um, okay, so let's talk about the more than music with MIDI. This is the more interesting stuff. Okay, so I thought, you know, we have, we have these really interesting uh, interfaces on a lot of these MIDI controllers, and I thought of ways to repurpose that. And so one of the things I built was a, just a simple color mixer. And I have this little output here that, you know, gives me my hex values, my HSL values. Make a little program change, and I can start mixing in uh, some of the other colors, like blue. Let's see. Maybe I want to add some red to this guy. Anyway, I thought that was sort of an interesting application. Uh, manipulating bleeding edge CSS features, same idea. Basically, um, only instead of just manipulating the color, we're using some of those really fun CSS filters. Oh, wait, I have to turn on this program and do that. Okay, now it'll work. Well, CP is not for, there we go. Yeah, so we can like play with hue rotate a little bit. We can play with blur, which is always kind of fun. Play with CPI. Anyway, I thought this would be sort of a fun interface to, you know, you could build like your own little, uh, you know, way to sort of fine tune, like tweaking your CSS and stuff. It was kind of a fun experiment. Let's see. Oops. <laughs> I forgot that it does the same thing on that. Oops. -a yeah, right. Oh, no, 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 no. There we go. Uh, drawing simple images on the launch pad. So I've got a, I think I haven't even used up here yet. Um, thank you. Uh, so, let's see, I'm just going to draw a little picture here. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah, that worked out okay. Um, does this one do something else? No, this one doesn't do anything else. I couldn't remember. <laughs> Um, so this one, actually, I just used the native web MIDI implementation because we can, if we use some like bit shifting, we can actually get the X, Y coordinates in a way that makes more sense than if we're treating it like musical notes, but that's not really worth going into in depth here. Um, this is another color uh, mixer, but with a more interesting um, MIDI controller that I found. This one has a built-in accelerometer, and so I can now like move my hand and kind of change the color, which is fun. Maybe if I find something I like, I can just click on it and save the value. Maybe I gotta figure out how I'm gonna get a red. I think I have to raise my hand like that, which is kind of strange. That, that was kind of fun, and I was playing around with that for a while, and I thought, well, you know what, that was, that was actually kind of, uh, that was actually kind of fun. I wonder if I could turn that like into a strange game. And the game was not as much fun, but now I, so I made this thing where, oh, that was a bad one. Let me reload it. Yeah, it's still kind of a bad one. Well, the objective is to try to match that color. And it looks a little gray, so maybe I broke something at some point here. Anyway, this is a good way to get carpal tunnel really quickly. You just trying to contort your hand to get these different colors. What else do we do? Um, what else do we have? Um, oh, this one. <laughs> yeah, and this one, then after I made that game, I thought, oh, what other games could I make with MIDI controllers? This would be kind of funny. And I always thought, well, I remember I, remember I loved Whack-A-Mole as a little kid. And I thought, you know, there's eight little pads on this thing. I could probably make a Whack-A-Mole game that would be pretty easy. And oh, Oh, wait, I got to do the right program. There we go. Wait, oh, I missed. Darn it. Uh, 
And what's kind of fun about this, <laughs> I told you, you're not going to learn anything you can use here. <laughs> um, one of the sort of interesting things I noticed in doing this is the, the MIDI controller can sense velocity. And so that confidence meter is, uh, it's trying to measure how hard I'm hitting it. I, I don't know how I got over 100%. I didn't realize I could do that. But um, yeah, so you can, you can add like more subtle layers to it that are kind of interesting. Um, oh, there's my little clicker. Turning a, this one was kind of interesting. So I was, I was looking at this and I was like, could I, maybe I could make checkers or chess or something like that. And, and then I decided maybe I can make Go. It's a little bit small. It's only eight by eight and I'm, I'm terrible at Go, so I don't really care. <laughs> but um, I, I thought it would be fun to turn the, the launch pad into Go and so I did that. Um, now you can't see it up here, so I'm going to turn on a little thing here that hopefully you can see. That works good. And so now, I'm going to play Go with myself. Wait, there we go. Yeah, and so this was actually really satisfying when I got this working because this actually goes back to the tiny computers thing, finally. I realized, so I found, I'm not going to take, I, I didn't build the Go game. I found an existing JavaScript Go um, implementation, which is really fantastic. Here, let me make this go away for a moment. Uh, called Tanuki JS, and what's beautiful about that is like it can work on the client side or it can work on the server side. And I haven't implemented it fully yet, but I uh, the plan is to get a server side Tanuki Go game going on one of those little computers, uh, just like attach it to the back of a launch pad. And now you have a really strange, you know, portable version of Go that you can play on your Innovation <laughs> launch pad. So that was kind of an interesting application of MIDI using MIDI to play Go. Um, what else here? AlphaGo AI not included. <laughs> Oops. And oh yeah, the other thing that I did is this whole slide deck. Like I'm controlling it with this little guy, which is actually sending MIDI signals to my 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 slide deck and making things go forward or backwards or triggering videos and audio sometimes. Uh, I've also got a foot controller down here that I've not used nearly as much, but it's the same kind of idea. I can just go back through my slides like this. It's kind of fun. Actually, I meant to use that more because that one's fun. <laughs> um, you know, and I, so I used the Reveal JS uh, framework. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that and have used that for things. Um, it was pretty, they have a really great API, so it was really easy to get the WebMIDI API to talk to that and have it do things. Um, I'm using a special kind of uh, Esperino called the PuckJS. And uh, it's a MIDI Bluetooth, or it's a Bluetooth controller that you can convert into a MIDI Bluetooth controller. Um, so I'm using that as my little clicker up here. Um, I have a lot of slides that talked about my goals and how I approached it, but I'm, I'm sort of running out of time here, so I'm going to kind of go through it pretty quickly. Um, you know, one of the challenges is that I have like six MIDI devices plugged into here, and like I had to figure out a way to differentiate between them, and so I explain how the that method is not good because it looks like this. And you have to do it like this, and that doesn't tell me which controller that is. So instead, we're going to do that, because I know that's the LPD-8 now, and I can do it this way, and da 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 da. I'm, I'm just going to race through these. I apologize. There is controller. That's actually, so that first bullet point, although I'm talking specifically about how I set up my slide deck, uh, that is like the thing that is true no matter what you're trying to do with MIDI. You have to learn the controller and its idiosyncrasies and how it chooses to map the different signals because, I mean, it's going to be very different. You know, I have another thing that looks a lot like the Novation um, launch pad up here, uh, but it behaves very differently and I spend a couple hours like figuring out like how it maps notes and if I hit this button and this button, all these bits shift this way, so I have to account for that and, and figure out things. Um, Right, yeah, I made a lot of slides about how I built this slide deck. I thought I would get to this part sooner. I apologize. <laughs> 
yeah, so there's a, you can't really see it from where you're sitting, but that's what the foot controller looks like. That's the other part I'm using. That's a zoomed up version of the, uh, the puck that I'm using. Here's my clicker. And there's a pseudocode breakdown of how I, the, um, the different floor buttons are breaking down to MIDI notes, and then those are triggering parts of the reveal API. Oh, there's also an expression pedal. That's kind of an interesting thing. I, I have this set just so I can like refresh the page when I do that. Because, you know, it screws up every once in a while, and I thought, oh, I'll probably have to refresh it, so I don't want to like type. And I actually forgot that was there because I was doing it over here. Oh, well. Um, yeah, just breaking out how it looks down the actual code. Uh, the puck was much more interesting, actually, once we get to the actual, this is like the actual code I had to put on the Esperino to get it to differentiate between a single click, a double click, and a triple click to trigger media and things like that. Um, we have to also advertise to the computer that we are a MIDI Bluetooth capable thing, and I just found this on the internet and copied it. That's evidently how you do that. I didn't know anything about that. I won't pretend to. Um, but that was an interesting, that was interesting. I thought this would be like the easy part of the project, but that turned out to be the one I spent the most time on. Um, oh yeah, how I approached the trigger media thing. Okay, so now I'm getting close to the end. Oh good, I'm getting close to the end of my slides and I'm already close to the end of my talk here. So this is a photo of an installation outside of the Experience Music Project in Seattle, Washington, which is pretty close to where I'm from. And it's an interactive musical kind of thing and I, I love stuff like that. But one of the things I really like about this is they've repurposed a bunch of um, things that are not musical items to create music. Um, and I, I'm just a sucker for stuff like that in general, but it, it, I wanted to end with that slide because I, I love stuff like that because it always makes me think of how can we repurpose something um, for things other than what they're intended, and that was the whole focus of my talk here was to be talking about how can we repurpose you know, MIDI and this musical language that was invented 30 some years ago for things that are not necessarily music and in creative and interesting ways. And there's a little video of this actually working. There were a bunch of kids there that day and we got them to play like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and it was kind of fun. So anyway, repurposing things for music, why not repurpose music for other things? Uh, Spasibo, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you for your speech. My Thank question you. is, mm -hmm. how about uh, OC MIDI? Uh, are there uh, JavaScript libraries implementing this protocol? Yes, there are. I, I flew over them really quickly, and I can, um, you know, actually, uh, so that website, I, I need to update a couple things on it, but I'm going to have a list of all the things I used okay. if you go to that website. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the talk. It was excellent. <laughs> but my question is, why MIDI? Why did you choose it? Is it like a simplest way to interact with hardware? I mean, there might be simpler ways. It, you don't have to... You know, I already had some, I, I, I'm a musician, <laughs> so I already had some MIDI stuff around. And it, what's funny is I was, I was playing around with my MIDI hardware and I was trying to do something musical with it and I was playing with this program and I found out I could write a JavaScript program to make it do what I needed. And then I realized, oh, well if I can, do, I didn't know I could do that in JavaScript. Well, I could make that button do anything now. And that kind of is what sent me down that whole path of thinking. Um, it seems like a very low barrier to entry uh, way to interact with hardware that's already out there. You don't have to solder things on a breadboard. You don't have to, the protocol is not complicated. It's just three numbers. Like if you ignore all the stuff I said about channels and bytes, it's like it sends you three numbers and you decide what those numbers mean. You know, they don't have to be notes. And, uh, do you know any alternatives for, for hardware interaction with browser? I'll say it one more time, I'm sorry. Uh, do you know any alternative ways to interact uh, to make an interaction between the browser and the hardware, like buttons, triggers, etc. 
Buttons and triggers. Um, what do you mean by alternative exactly? How do other people do that? How do other people do? Uh, without, I mean, other people without web MIDI. Without MIDI, yes. Um, what technologies do they use? Oh, uh, I oh, um, I understand now. Um, do you say mouse? <laughs> mouse and the keyboard and the <laughs> no. This is, uh, I mean, like if we go back to the beginning of the talk when I was talking about Arduino programming, like that is sort of I think maybe more in the spirit of what you're talking about. And um, I mean, there's just other languages you can use and things like that. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I hope I answered that. Okay. Last question. Uh, hello. Thanks to, for, for your talk. Sure. Thanks for having me. And, um, what is the simplest way to connect some device like uh, MIDI fighter to browser? Uh, did you say MIDI file or just MIDI device? I mean, the simplest way is like USB, uh, right? Is no, that, no. Uh, okay. MIDI, MIDI fighter uh, that uh, can send to computer MIDI nodes. Oh, I see. Um, there are there are a couple existing libraries that I found that do a good job. Simplest way. This, uh, um, Actually, it it can be it, it can be uh, any device that can send media nodes to computer. What the simplest way to connect it with a browser? Um, can you give me an example? Um, I... MIDI keyboard. MIDI keyboard. Okay, I see. Um, I mean, the simplest way, like, I, I found this online for, like, really cheap. And it, you just, it's just a USB cable. You just plug it in and it, it works. I'm misunderstanding. I'm sorry. Uh, the simplest library or API to connect. Oh, I, well, I would say it's like the Web MIDI uh, API that's built into Chrome. You don't have to download or install anything. It's like your, your Chrome browser right now on your computer can do this uh, without anything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say that's the easiest way. 